Hello and welcome to Dinesh Guarda, Cities ABC and Open Business Council series. We are a fast-growing YouTube and podcast thought leadership channel focused on profiling the global leading inspiring people, CEOs, authors, technologists, academics, and people that are framing and creating a new vision for our world, especially looking at solutions how we can actually get better results for the problems that we are facing. In this channel, we've been actually highlighting ideas, products, inventions, software, books and solutions to the multiple challenges and opportunities we face in our cities and our society. But we face specially and we actually profile special people. People that are inspiring, people that are doing fantastic projects and people that are trying to transform our world with all the areas and all the challenge from fourth industrial revolution to blockchain, AI, and all the frontier tech technologies that are disrupting and as well accelerating our evolution as humanity. This podcast series are produced and distributed on citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org and syndicated on intelligenthq.com, fashionabc.org, edgefink.com and tradersdna.com, our associate partners and as well media platforms. So today I welcome to our series, Sir Simon Mayall. Lieutenant General Sir Simon Mayall has a distinguished 40 years plus career in the British Army, during which he served in Germany, North Ireland, the Balkans, the Middle East and Central Asia. So Simon Mayall also has held several high-level appointments in the policy world of the Minister of Defense. From his family background, academic inclination, and professional, professional choice and circumstances, he served much of his time in Arabia. So Simon Mayall spent three years on segment, sec, secondment of the Sultan of Oman's armed forces and was the operations officer of the first UK armed division during the liberation of Kuwait in the first Gulf War. Having studied modern history of, at Oxford, including a specialization at the crusading period, he was also a writer of a book on Turkish security policy and completed a thesis on jihad ideology for his master at King's College. In 2006, Sir Simon Mayall was the deputy commanding general for the multinational corps in Iraq. Having been both assistant chief of the general staff and deputy chief of defense staff operations, he set up the post of defense senior advisor for the Middle East, in which appointment he was responsible for the new Royal Navy base in Bahrain, Britain's first permanent military base east of Suez since 1971. Sir Simon Mayall's last appointment was as Prime Minister Cameron's security envoy to Iraq and the Kurdish regional government after the fall of the Mosul to Islamic State in 2014. Having retired in 2015, General Mayal acts as a senior advisor to the Green Hill and to Kutz Bank. Sir Simon Mayall appears regularly on television and radio discussing issues around the Middle East and defense and his book Soldier in the Sand a personal history of the Middle East was published this year. Sir Simon Mayall was knighted in 2014, and he also holds the US Legion of Merit for service in Iraq. So Sir Mar Simon, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I'm quite excited to welcome you to our series. And um, I'm actually uh, puzzled with all the different things you've been achieving, but we'll go that step by step. So welcome to our series. Thank you very much, and it's a uh, great privilege to be here. Very much looking forward to our conversation. So, my pleasure, and I think, so I want to start by, so you have a, um, a very uh, special background uh, that uh, has been looking in terms of a lot of different areas that made who you are, and as well your achievements. So, could you tell us about an introduction about you, a bit of your family and background, and the education as well, to start? Yeah, certainly. Um, I may say it didn't start as a general. That was the uh, <laughs> for 40 years of a, of a, a career uh, that I hugely enjoyed and found hugely professionally and personally satisfying. But, um, but my 
sort of professional engagement and personal and academic engagement in the Middle East really went all the way back to my grandparents. Uh, and my grandfather was a very, very distinguished engineer uh, during the First World War, uh, sort of civil engineer in many ways. Uh, he went to India after the war. My grandmother was a very distinguished doctor uh, from, from Southern Ireland. Uh, she also went to India after the war. And so uh, they were so east of Suez, quite, quite, quite sort of pioneering in their own way, particularly my grandmother, who was a, a very distinguished doctor at a time when doc female doctors were few and far between. Um, my father uh, was a pilot in the Air Force. Uh, he was too young for the Second World War. Um, uh, and my mother, funnily enough, um, became an actress on the West End stage. Uh, and they met quite by chance before my father went to the Canal Zone. So he was um, in, in the Great Basin Ishmaelia uh, on the canal in 1951, not, not long before the Suez Crisis. Uh, so we're talking not long after the end of the Second World War. Um, and he was then involved in the, I suppose, stabilization of the Hashemite monarchy uh, in 58. And then in 59, uh, when I was a real youngster, he and my mother and myself and my younger brother went to Aden. And so I was brought up from a very early age, sort of surrounded by people speaking Arabic in that sort of harsh, desert, hot environment of the Middle East. And um, I think for any of you who can uh, ever talk to your parents or have children, uh, you'll know how formative those years between two and five can be. Uh, and although my military career really began in Germany after I'd been to Oxford uh, studying history, another great, great uh, introductory subject, I think, for looking into the building blocks of contemporary political problems, either ethnic, religious, or dare I say, just the experience of history. Um, but my early uh, military career was very firmly based on um, facing down the Russians, uh, the Soviet Union, as it were, uh, uh, in a cavalry regiment, an armored regiment in NATO, uh, based in, in, in Central Europe. Um, and so I spent the first five years of my career uh, in Germany um, and we were looking very firmly to the east uh, although for the British Army we also still had a big major commitment in Northern Ireland at the time um, but um, having got rather I suppose not dissatisfied but finding the sort of routine of Germany um, began to pull I suddenly realized that we had a number of officers from the British Army who served with the Sultan of Oman, uh, the late Sultan Qaboos, who died just under, just under a year ago, um, but was really was the father of his nation. And uh, he had been tackling a sort of communist pan-Arab threat combination. Uh, and so I went to serve for the Sultan of Oman for three years, um, commanding an Arab tank squadron. Uh, and that really just, it just felt so natural going back there, hence well, I mentioned about those formative years in, in Aden, um, speaking Arabic, listening to Arabic. Um, and I really deeply fell in love with that country um, and it just fed a, fed a huge interest in the Middle East. Uh, and not long after that, amazingly, the sort of Berlin Wall fell. Uh, and to our amazement, we found ourselves um, back out in the desert uh, alongside our American allies and a big coalition uh, because Saddam Hussein despite having just fought a sort of 10-year war against the Iranians after the Iranian Revolution of 79, decided to invade Kuwait. And again, we sort of got more, more involved again back in the Middle East. Um, and I'd been brought up at the time of the oil embargo. Uh, I was doing my revision for my A-levels by candlelight because we had the, uh, the three-day week and the strikes. We just didn't have the energy. So the sort of practical understanding of the geopolitics and the importance of, uh, of, of, of the energy equation was uh, really important. And really, quite a, quite a lot of my career then inevitably came back to the Middle East. We, we were involved in the Balkans. Um, in the 90s, I went to the Balkans in Northern Ireland. But then, of course, we went into the, the period of what we call the wars of 9-11. Um, and again, many of your listeners or viewers or, or yourself, Dennis, will remember what a you know, cataclysmic moment that was in, in world, contemporary world history, 9-11, uh, 11th of September. Um, and, uh, and that drew us very rapidly, as you recall, into Afghanistan uh, and then Iraq. Um, and in Iraq, I sort of took a, a knowledge of Arabic and a knowledge of the Middle East, um, a knowledge of sectarianism, which made us 
uh, we've rather under, under, underplayed, I think, in our planning issues of ethnic and religious diversity or division. And I was the deputy coalition commander from 2006 to 2007, um, just before the surge. Um, when it had become a big, big political issue, as you know, of course, Western European countries particularly, uh, and not least in Britain, it was linked to Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Um, and really coming back, I then did a number of jobs in the Ministry of Defence, but a lot of them still running operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, among other, other things, including piracy. Funnily. And my last sort of big um, job in the, in the military was to be the government's defence senior advisor for the Middle East. Um, so I was able to take the personal relationships, the sort of understanding the, the, the politics and go back. And I was very instrumental in trying to refocus Britain that had a very strong historical locus in the Middle East, particularly in the Gulf, uh, where we've been the sort of guardian in many ways of Gulf security for you know, 150 years. Uh, and convincing the British government that we should re reinvest there. And, and um, my great legacy was the, the, uh, the new British naval base in Bahrain, uh, which was formally opened in, in 20, 2018, and I feel very proud of that. Um, and, and so, as I say, so I have a long answer about <laughs> background and connectivity, um, and we can pick up on some of those, but it's been a, quite an interesting three-generational uh, family connection east of Suez, and then a very direct one through my father, and then um, a, a sort of um, an academic, professional, and um, personal, personal one through my, own, through my own career and interests. An amazing history, and I think part of that history is as well the history of the 20th century, which touched a lot of different areas, especially the second half of the 20th century, and as well all the geopolitical major um, events that we had in the last, uh, uh, well, half a decade, uh, half a century, let's put it that way. So I, I want to go back to your um, education and as well to your family background. So uh, you studied in Oxford, that was a very important time for your um, for formation and for your education, but as well to, to create who you are right now. Yeah. And as well, one of the things that uh, I know from, from some of the research as well is that that made you look at the way you see the world and a lot of different things so i want to touch that background of your education and as well how did you choose um the military career after after oxford as well because it's two different things and of course you have that in the family but it's measured different things as well i mean to be honest with you, I, I, I went to oxford on a scholarship with the army um i was a sort of classic eldest son uh, but I wanted to follow my father, you know, I wanted to emulate my father, who had sadly died about four years ago, but was a great, great influence in my life. Um, uh, and I wanted to be a pilot, and I was going to read uh, maths, physics, and chemistry. I was going to go to Cambridge, and I was going to go into the Royal Air Force. Uh, and I went to selection at, um, at Biggin Hill. And um, I, I always say, rather, rather, I don't mean to trivialize it, but they found I couldn't really pat my head and rub my stomach at the same time, competently. <laughs> so it was absolutely clear I was not going to be a pilot. And I came back and my father, although he was in the Air Force, had spent two years at Sandhurst. And although he was slightly disappointed I wasn't going to follow him into the uh, Air Force, uh, he said, well, what about the Army? So I went off to do the selection for Sandhurst. Uh, and past that when I was, I must have been 17 at the time. Uh, and one of the reasons I was keen to go into the army or the military, actually, and the army was a much better fit for me, to be quite honest with you, uh, was precisely the linkage between, you know, as Klaus has pointed out, you know, war is politics by other means. Even at quite an early age, I really wasn't that interested in, in, in sciences. It was not, I, uh, other people are, and I admire them hugely for it. But I, my, my natural bent was literature was history particularly uh, and was uh, and was politics geography as well which i think is a very important part so i then they said well if you're if you're keen to join the army we i, I then got a place at Balliol college at oxford to read history uh, and the army said if you think you'd like to come into the army afterwards we will pay for you to go through through oxford so i had my place in the army i had my place at oxford and they just came came together um and funny enough i was you know the joy of oxford and you know, the joy I've been a good education. And so again, so many of your listeners and viewers will know, it's just 
you know, as you come out of school, that you know, those early days, those early steps into adulthood. Uh, and that uh, if you've got wonderful teachers, which I did have as tutors, you, it really is the mind broadening that it really is a most, a most wonderful privilege to have spent three years, A, in a beautiful city, which Oxford obviously is, in a, in a college, which was a sort of atmosphere that really suited me, um, with, with some outstanding tutors, one of which was a, a person called um, Morris Keane, uh, which uh, may or may not be known to one or two of your uh, listeners who's, who wrote the, the, the um, definitive book on chivalry. So I was really fascinated by medieval history. And within that, funny enough, the, 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 the thing that he, he was then teaching was the Crusades, um, the sort of you know, the great military pilgrimages of the 11th, 12th and 13th century. Uh, and the more one looked at that as an academic issue you know, of their time, um, the more one saw the resonances in our modern era. And of course, after 9-11, there was a huge up, uptick of interest in what was seen the clash of civilizations, the Huntington's clash of civilizations. Uh, in this case, Christendom and, and Islam. So it was very, uh, it was, it, it was a, another building, formative building block, um, which I didn't realize in my own sense, you know, the significance it was going to have in my understanding of a part of the world I came to be very heavily focused on as my career developed. Uh, it is worth saying, and you, you may, may know that already, Dennis, I then mid-career before I went to command my regiment, um, I went back to Oxford to go to uh, St. Anthony's College, uh, which is a postgraduate, basically deals in geopolitics. And I wrote a, I wrote a thesis on um, Turkey, uh, called Turkey Thwarted Ambition. Uh, and that again, the, my, my initial interest in Turkey when I went there to Istanbul in 1980 was actually through the Crusades. I went there to, I went there to go look, look at the Theodosian walls. Um, and of course, that stage was that huge interest in the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which again you know, has been written about many times. And one took that back, and it's just the way these things kept coming together in my, as I say, my own development. But the academic background was, you know, it was hugely, it's been both hugely influential and I think hugely useful uh, when you're dealing with highly politically charged areas of the world like, like the Middle East, to use a, a, a bit of a, a slightly idle catch-all for a very diverse part of the world with very diverse peoples and histories. And that's, that's impressive. And I think uh, your academic background, your knowledge of history, and then, of course, your own personal background in terms of uh, growing up in Middle East since childhood, and then studying that made a very big understanding of a very complex um, region that is still one of the most complex regions to, to study, but is as well the birth of civilizations because everything started there. So, so I think going uh, just on the follow-up and following your career, so um, after studying and uh, then going through this academic background to the military growth, uh, that you started the career, which is true sometimes not so much in careers because the academic and the military are completely different, although you need to do a lot of research, especially if you go to the military career, to, especially if you go to more uh, senior positions and, of course, for the positions that you've been holding. So how did you match these two positions? I think it's quite interesting to look your academic uh, in-depth knowledge and, and as well your astonishing career in the military um, uh, background. Well, I think interestingly, the, the army are very good. Most, most militaries in democratic, actually, I, think, well, I wouldn't even say that. Militaries are quite good about uh, encouraging people to pursue academic, academic study. Um, and as I say, inevitably, military history is an important part of, um, of the study of the military art. Uh, but you can't study military history unless you understand, I suppose, the political context in which military operations took, took place. Um, but it was interesting, when I, when I went to Germany in, in 1979, I didn't need to frankly understand the politics of the Cold War. I needed to be te technically and tactically proficient. I was going to command a, 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 a tank, uh, a, a tank a platoon, a tank troop, a tank company, squadron, and a tank regiment. Um, and the politics was of less interest to me. It was, it was of interest to me. But, you know, 
day to day, it didn't matter. If, if, if the Cold War went hot, we would have to fight. Um, however, a lot of my peer group had been in Northern Ireland. Um, and for instance, and there it was much grayer. It was much, although they were wandering around with lethal weapons, you know, the threat was coming really from uh, being caught between two very, very divided sectarian communities. So you had to understand the law, you had to understand the media, which of course became increasingly obtrusive uh, through my career, as did, as did, as did legal issues. Um, you needed to understand the politics, you needed to understand the points of reference that people had, what motivated them, why did they hate each other, what were these parades, what was the significance of the Apprentice Boys March, what was Drum Cree. And of course, when the Cold War ended, we very quickly found ourselves in, in Bosnia, in the Balkans. And it was interesting there that, you know, we suddenly realized that what we talked of was Yugoslavia. Um, if you didn't understand the, the Serbs were sort of Orthodox Christian, that the Croats were Catholics, obviously that the, uh, you know, the Albanians were, were Muslim, that the Kosovans were Muslim, there were Muslims. Yeah, if you didn't understand what motivated ethnic solidarity and equally ethnic division, it, you, your, your military response was going to be uh, less, than, less than helpful. And so we became increasingly more, although our primary role was as tank regiments or artillery or engineers, we were constantly being put into very, very complex, uh, complex geo, geopolitical issues where the lines on the map uh, could be as much a hindrance as a help in, um, in, in corralling a particular problem set. And of course, in all these uh, things, you know, not only were politicians there, but the United Nations was there, the EU was there, the NGOs were there, clearly the media were there. We'd seen a bit of it, I have to say. I mean, the last, the last what I would call straight war battle I took part in, of course, was the liberation of Kuwait. And that again was a classic one. That was a much more old fashioned state on state, former coalition, diplomacy fails, over to the military, defeat the enemy, politics and diplomacy comes back into play. And of course in the Balkans or Afghanistan or Iraq, that, that was nothing was as clear cut as, as that. Um, and so it became increasingly important as more and more graduates came into the army. I was, the, I was the only graduate in my regiment when I joined. When I commanded my regiment about 15, 16 years later, almost all my new officers were graduates. So we had a more, I won't say more intelligent cohort, but we definitely had a better educated cohort. Um, and, the, and the complexity of what we were dealing with meant that it was very much in our interest to encourage people to go for through life learning, to take, go to open university, to do distance learning, to go to staff college and do another degree, um, occasionally, as I did, to go away for a year to study something at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and at, at Staff College, increasingly, the conversation was, was as much about politics as it was about military manoeuvre. Um, and eventually, I was lucky enough to go to higher command and staff course. And that is really on the sort of strategy. What, you know, how do you influence political decision makers? How do you influence diplomats? How do you you educate diplomats about the limitations of the military arm. How do you make sure you understand the pressures politicians are under and diplomats? How do you understand how you build coalitions? Um, and then slightly further on in 2003, I actually went to the Royal College of Defence Studies. And that was a year uh, with about 80 of us from 50 different countries. Um, some military, some diplomatic, some political, some academic. And again, the whole idea to continue to give people um, a, a sort of better understanding of, of what is possible, what is difficult, what is credible, what is uh, useful in, 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 in very complex um, operations and how you can influence or use or be informed by various, various aspects of a, of a political, of a geopolitical problem. Um, so I would say, I think increasingly, the army, and by the army, I, I mean the military, has moved into, into a sort of more academic political space 
while trying not to do, while, while trying to keep true to our primary profession, which is at the disposal, hopefully, of well-informed, well-intentioned politicians and diplomats. Well, that's, that's, uh, there's a lot of complexity in what you just mentioned. And I think especially, uh, like you mentioned, from your academic background, studying history, and actually, well, looking at, uh, uh, you did the thesis and, and research as well in the Turkish and all this, um, you, all that geopolitical and as well area that is very important still now. And then going through all the, the history and the contemporary, because you are always between the two things. So where is studying, but then coming up with the practice with all the work you were doing. So I, I want to touch uh, more on the theoretical part and from a research perspective. So it's one of the things I like is looking at history to look at the present and history tells us a lot of things and repeats itself, but never, never, re, never rhyming. Like uh, there's an right. expression. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so can you just, uh, so from this experience, which is really impressive, but as well, quite complex because in one end is having this academic background and the other end is looking at uh, all the sensibilities of the politics. And as well, there's a sense of, uh, human social capacity to deal with people that is very important especially if you are in the military because you have to deal with your uh, command teams uh, you have then to deal with the politicians that are behind this and as well the different changes in governments that come and at the same time then all the geopoliticals there so how did you look at these the three different things because i think it's particularly interesting for me as a ceo and someone looking at these things but everyone looking at this because in the end of the day the middle east is still in the spotlight uh, probably more than ever right now in a lot of ways yeah um it is difficult and you've got to be slightly careful about you know if you're a general you know let, let's say you're a relatively senior officer from colonel upwards you know your responsibility is of course you know, Clausewitz again, to the political objectives for which military uh, action is required. You have a responsibility downwards as well. You're commanding your soldiers who are, you know, will carry out your orders. Um, those orders have to be legal. Um, they have to have a, a moral, you know, training needs a moral compass to it. Um, and so you're, you're right to an extent, you know, the, you, 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 the, the military is sometimes very much acting as the, the, the rubber in a strategy um, because you're trying, to, you're trying to take the policy objectives of politicians and diplomats, and it might be, it might be multinational organizations as well, it could be EU, um, and then you're trying to work out how you're going to turn it into physical activity on the ground that is useful for the achievement of the political objectives. And sometimes one had to say to the, 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 um, the politicians, look, we get war is politics by other means. We know that every action we take is a political action. But you've got to understand also that politics is war by other means. And how you set up the political environment with which we operate is really important to how we, how we operate. What you say in public, what you set as the objectives, uh, how you resource an operation really either makes it harder or easier for us to use the military line of operation to support your political objectives. And of course that becomes, you know, in some ways, as I said, uh, you know, take the Falkland Islands. That becomes rel relatively easy in the sense that the politicians say, we are going to retake the Falkland Islands. What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and ring fence Argentina to stop other countries supporting them. We're going to engage with our transatlantic uh, allies, the Americans, uh, to get them politically on board. We're going to go to the UN. We're going to try and you know, make sure the French aren't uh, providing you know, XZ missiles to the Argentinians. Uh, and then we're going to put enough military resource to take the Falkland Islands back, which we did. And, and at that stage, the military, of course, it's the chance of the battlefield. Go back to the first Gulf War. Well, again, build your coalition, get your UN support, get your legal mandate, build up enough resources, build the coalition, make sure you know the objection is, is about liberating uh, Kuwait. Uh, it's not necessarily about regime change. Execute the operation, hand back to politics. In fact, 
as I write in my book, we didn't end the war well enough. It's one of the reasons I think we ended up in 2003. But when you go into somewhere like Afghanistan or Iraq, and you start saying, right, we're, we're about uh, you know, elimination of opium, we're about education of uh, women, uh, we're about bringing democracy, uh, we're about uh, you know, constitutional development, nation building, then the military begin to get a little bit nervous about what their role is in this. If you've got a, you know, Germany after the Second World War, maybe Japan, um, a sort of compliant population, there's been a very clear end to a war, you're providing security, quite rightly, that's what people want. Uh, you're getting infrastructure up and running, uh, you're making sure there's no looting, uh, you're helping with logistic supplies, uh, you might be doing some institutional building in the MOD, Ministry of Defense, or an army. Um, but when you find, as we did in Afghanistan and Iraq, that, that the, the political objectives are getting a bit blurred, and the assumptions that the politicians have sent you in on a mission for have not proved to be as benign as you thought they might be, then you are getting into quite a difficult situation. And what you've got, of course, is a lot of young young men, mostly young men, young men and women with lethal weapons on the street looking for um, ways in which they can push the, the mission forward and not make it go backwards. Um, and General Rupert Smith used to refer to the strategic court call, uh, which basically in the modern era of, of me, me, you know, the media, social media, uh, every person, a, a, you know, witness through a, you know, a, 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 an iPhone, etc. You know, individual actions by quite junior people on the streets, in the fields, in the jungles, in the hamlets, in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the deserts, of course, can be instantly played back into a very critical um, uh, political uh, public, public audience. So these sort of things need to be understood by senior officers. Because I say they're, they're, they, they form that buffer, that rubber buffer between the politicians telling them what the objectives are and, of course, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, men and women, who are going to carry out the actions. Some of it kinetic, some of it, of course, with equipment, but quite a lot of it an interface between human beings, some in uniform, some not, some adversarial, some neutral, some dangerous. And so senior generals need to be able to be very clear to politicians or very, you know, truth under power um, about what is and what is not possible. Now, at the end of the day, we are the servants of the state. You know, we will do what our, 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 you know, our elected politicians will tell us to do. But equally, it's unusual if elected politicians will tell us to do something that's either illegal, um, impossible, uh, or under-resourced. But Politicians are under a lot of problem, uh, under a lot of pressures, as, as you know. In your uh, history background, that I, it's particularly interesting for me as well. I, I love history, um, and so your history background have been actually quite powerful for your career as well, because uh, your studies, and um, especially from your family background as well, because you grew up in Middle East from your family background and your father as well and all this, this context, and then you study as well that, and then you end up actually having a career that dealt with all these different areas and contexts. So what, uh, let's go back to history and what did you took from this uh, research and your academic work that you put on that uh, work, both with the politicians, with the governments, and especially with the military uh, operations that you were managing at the time? Well, the other thing about being in the, in the military, uh, Dennis, is, is, of course, as you become more senior, um, and it depends how, how governments change, but you find that you, you've got a lot of friends already as political, um, or sorry to say, professional civil servants. So you, you run into a lot of the people who are in the Ministry of Defence. You have run into a lot of people in the Department for International Development, a lot of people, obviously, in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And if you're a sensible <laughs> officer, you have tried to build uh, relationships and friendships uh, in your time as you go up through the, through the military. 
And, and very often you, either because they were at university with you or you have worked with them, there, you have friends in the political sphere. And again, when you're trying to put together a strategy at the beginning of an operation, was you go into an operation. Uh, it's a very sensible officer who makes it his business to re-energize or reactivate all his big network of, of friends, A, to educate himself, uh, and B, to educate other people. And so it's a constant dialogue within government. Um, but as I say, quite often a lot of it's under pressure. There's time pressure, there's events, there's media, there's getting a message out, there's a lot of personalities involved, um, there's a lot of egos involved, there's agendas running through it. Uh, but the key, of course, at a certain level, is if you do know people, you can't guarantee it. Um, find, finding your way through to say, how can I get in front of somebody who I believe would, would uh, what's the word, benefit from my advice on this? Or equally could tell me exactly what it is they're trying to achieve, because sometimes um, objectives are laid out in policy terms that you sort of say, well, hang about, what does that actually mean? And you, you, need, to be able to, you need to be able to interrogate uh, bold statements. And, uh, you know, we, 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 all, we live in a world of, sort of, uh, of, of sound bites and things. But when you delve down and say, give me the second and third order issues, what, what do you mean by this? And sometimes we use words badly. Um, and I remember in, uh, when I was in, in Iraq and I was the deputy coalition commander, uh, to an American, a wonderful man called Peter Corelli. Uh, and then I worked with David Petraeus and a number of other people that, uh, again, your, 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 your network would, would know. And we were getting hit very badly by explosive form projectiles that were quite clearly coming in from Iran. You know, there were IEDs that were getting us and they were, they were locally manufactured and they were, they were causing us a lot, of, a lot of casualties. Oh, and dare I say, a lot of casualties among the Iraqi people as well. It was a huge bombing campaign in, um, uh, in, in uh, Iraq. But we realized much of that and the suicide bombing was from the Sunni side. But EFPs were being manufactured in Iran and were being used by the Shia militia against us. And the Americans put up a, a mission that said, destroy Iranian influence in Iraq. And I was left saying, look, I, I think A, the word destroy for the military has a very kinetic uh, implication behind it. That we actually go and knock things down. Um, and the reality is, uh, and I'm afraid, is you know, having gone into Iraq to bring democracy, I quote, we have obviously empowered the Shia because they are the majority, 60% majority. And inevitably, because they are co-religionists with the Iranians. Oh, and by the way, they sit alongside Iran and have done for time immemorial. Destroying Iranian influence in Iraq is nigh on impossible. And we ended up having a mission statement that said, defeat Iranian malign interference in Iraq. Now that, that was, a, again, difficult enough because that was a political objective. But it was just interesting to bring some of the politics in and just say, we're careful. Careful how, careful how you translate this. You start telling soldiers at, at a junior level to destroy something, that is what they'll do. You start telling commanders to defeat something, that does not necessarily imply you need to pull the trigger at all. Defeating requires that you achieve your objectives and you have mitigated or nullified the threat. And in this case, the threat was a malign Iranian influence. But it was an influence that in some ways, because we'd overthrown Saddam, and not established a firm security base in Iraq was one that we'd been responsible for generating. Yeah, that's a very important uh, uh, detail and actually components of, of the work of military, but as well of leadership, because leadership is, like you said, it is achieving something with the wisdom as well, because it's very important. So one of the things I wanted to touch is, um, from your parents' background to your education, you went through a bit of a, a new Britain that was constituted from the Second World War to all these different parts, and as well, all these colonies that were as well uh, becoming independent and all these different areas. So 
How do you see this new geopolitical order that uh, you've been seeing from your career, but the right now is actually changing still? And then I will want to go to the Middle East, but I'm particularly interested to hear how do you see this part of the, yeah, this, this uh, diversion, let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's, it's very interesting. The, um, you know, at the moment we're going through a period where uh, it, it, it worries me that the, 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 the attitude to history is becoming very his, ahistorical. People are determined to say, well, we didn't really like that bit of history, it doesn't suit our agenda, or it does not, not, doesn't align with our cultural or ideological um, certainties or priorities, and therefore we're going to uh, suppress it. It's very dangerous, it's extremely dangerous. Um, and equally, I, I utterly uh, dislike the idea that we judge uh, the motivations, the actions, uh, of, of people, except in the context of their time. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't be critical, but it does, it does mean having a degree of imagination to say, what was it like to be such and such a person, uh, be it ethnically, be it class, be it professionally, in, 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 this, in this environment. No, no, we're not talking internet, we're not talking social media, we're talking about people who couldn't travel faster than a horse could go. We're talking about people who were brought up with different senses of identity and culture and inherited histories and didn't travel much, etc. So um, when people are critical about uh, the sort of British Empire, which of course my grandparents were very, very firmly part of, um, you've got to say, no, for them, you know, don't be, if you're critical of them, you'll be critical about what my grandparents did. My father built ports in India ports that are still thriving, ports that are part of India's both present and future. Um, he educated people, he trained people, he, um, he imparted knowledge, he cared for them, uh, and he did something well worthwhile. My grandmother, uh, as I said, this amazing woman who went, uh, into, was in the trenches in the First World War uh, as a doctor, um, went to India to help set up the Harding uh, hospital for women and children. You know, she gave, my grandfather gave 25 years of his life. My grandmother gave uh, about 12 years of her life in India, although my grandparents separate. Um, and my father, of course, you know, lived through the Second World War. You know, when he joined the, the, the Royal Air Force, he joined it as an utterly patriotic young man wanting to serve his country. And of course, the world he lived in after the Second World War was, of course, you know, that's, that's, this is just this is, this is comment. Um, was, was obviously the, the end of empires. Um, Britain exhausted by her efforts to fight Nazi Germany and Japanese militarism. Um, and the zeitgeist was very firmly against, uh, against, uh, 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 against imper imperialism and colonialism. And yet I think Britain had a very, very honorable attempt to extricate herself from uh, her colonies while actively trying to leave uh, countries that could stand on their own two feet. Um, and in many ways, you could say it was slightly, uh, slightly quicker than it might have been. Uh, our position in the Gulf was totally different, of course. The Gulf states were never, never colonies of Britain. Aden was uh, where, we, where we lived, but no, nowhere else. Um, and I think the reality of uh, Britain's capacity to talk in political terms about global Britain I think Britain's place in the United Nations, Britain's place through the Anglosphere, Britain's place through NATO, Britain's place through its huge expatriate population, its English language, uh, and not, not least at all, uh, and, and I would argue of increasing importance to Britain, is, is the Commonwealth. So there's the Venn diagram at the centre of which Britain can sit if it has enough confidence and ambition uh, and can contribute, continue to contribute, much more in partnership with equals, um, I think is important. And I am definitely, uh, unashamedly, um, influenced by, you know, my father's, uh, my father's attitudes, my father's service to Her Majesty and to uh, Britain's national interest, and by my grandparents' um, contribution to, by their own lights, their important contribution to um, uh, particularly, partic particularly India, but uh, not, not India alone. So these remain very important influences in my life, and I, I don't like to see them denigrated, uh, and I don't like to see them dismissed, and I think uh, people who don't um, put a, at least a credible and 
sensible uh, way history and the balance of all their other determinations are, are, are doomed to make appalling mistakes um, at all sorts of levels. No, and I think it's very important, the sense of history. I think we cannot uh, delete history. You can just learn with it. And whatever it is, actually have a sense of responsibility and sense of honor as well, like you just mentioned. I completely subscribe. I think uh, we have effectively a big tendency right now to kind of delete history and put it in question because of sometimes the most uh, uh, trends of the day. Let's put it that way. So, well, sorry, I will just say, Dennis, because you... Yeah, no, no, completely. <laughs> A little while ago, I, 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 we were having a, it was before I left the army, we had a big discussion about um, what, what were the threats coming up. It was a classic sort of MI6, MI5, and the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office. And I said one of the big threats, I think, that really is going to come at us and has been growing since the end of the Cold War are, are, are people who don't believe the sort of Fukuyama vision that all the issues have been settled, liberal democracy, Western democratic forms, etc., are are the norm, we're, we're advancing that. Um, I said, I, I buy Samuel Huntington, Clash of Civilizations. We're gonna be confronted with a, people with a very strong sense of historical entitlement. And they'll really have historical grievance and historical uh, ambition and inspiration. And I would put in that category, I think you could look at President Putin uh, and Russia's sense of itself, revanchism. I think you could absolutely put um, China in that category. Uh, I think you could very, uh, very, uh, very firmly say that a lot of what motivates Iran is, is a sense of, um, of its great, great pre-Islamic imperial past, let alone its rather more modern history. I think you know, the Egyptians, I think a lot of people around the world, um, one might say, are enthralled to their history. And I think that's equally dangerous, but, but equally have a very strong sense of history and if you don't understand that or you've rejected your own history or you can't challenge them when they are misusing history you're 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 you're, you're missing missing out and i again if you'll forgive me a, a small anecdote um when i was in kosovo my serbian friends used to talk to me about the, the field of the blackbirds uh 1389 when prince lazar was and the serbians were defeated by Sultan Murad, in fact, both of the commanders died at the battle. But they would say, well, wasn't it ghastly? You know, that's it, you know, you, know, you should be supporting us. Um, and, uh, you know, we Serbians were holding the line for Christendom and uh, we were defeated and, you know, it all went horribly wrong from there. And because I know a lot about the, cru the Crusades, I said, ah, oh, yes, but it is true that actually uh, in 1396 at the Battle of Nicopolis, it was actually the Serbian cavalry uh, working for the Ottoman Empire that defeated the Burgundian Hungarian Crusade. And they go, uh, 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 uh. Um, you say, no, no, I, I, I have no problem with you knowing your history and the important bits of your history. But the important thing is not, not to allow you just a, a completely un, 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 uh, uh, unmodulated, unrefined view of those bits of history that just feed. Um, sort of modern, a modern sense of grievance. We cannot just take parts of history and contextual it for what we want, but you can as well not delete the entire history. So I think we have the two paradox. And at the moment, this is actually very important to, to I think, to understand the world geopolitics, because you have a lot of uh, uh, sensitive spots around the world that are very, um, um, in a lot of very turbulence, because precisely that. In one end, deleting history, in the other end, Picking parts of history and take, take him out of, taking out of context. So I think this brings me to your global um, and as well recognized expertise in Middle East. So the Middle East is a complex puzzle uh, that from the dawn of civilization has been making and changing the global geopolitics. Um, and, uh, and as well, it's been so changing, but as well so uh, complex because you have you mentioned Iraq, you mentioned um, Egypt, uh, a lot of other countries that are still in the middle of a lot of uh, changes, but some of them more than others. So, how do you see this complex uh, puzzle, especially with all your background and in the context of the book? And I want to go to the book after this. Well, there's, I, I think earlier on I, was, I said you know the importance of geography and history, um, and I when I do lecture on this, I, I sort of put up obviously a map of the modern Middle East, 
which is very familiar to everybody um, with, with the lines. Um, and then if you, if you take the lines off and just look at the Middle East topographically, you find you've got, uh, you know, if you start in the East, you've got um, the Zagros Mountains and the, you know, the, the central plateau of, of Iran. And then you come round to the South and you've got the deserts of, um, of base of the Arabian Peninsula. Go to the West, you have the Nile Delta, the Red Sea, the Nile Delta, obviously the Suez Canal now, but that was sort of clearly not, but, the, but that isthmus there. And then you come around to the north, and then you get, get the Mediterranean, then you come to the north, you've got the, tar, the, the Tarsus Mountains of, um, of Turkey. And, and largely, those are, the, those are the big building blocks. In the middle of it, amazingly, you've got, of course, the Tigris and Euphrates River, um, and of course the headwaters that come out of Basra or, or near Basra down in, into the, the Gulf. Um, you've then got the Syrian, the Syrian plain and then you go into the Syrian highlands, uh, uh, the Lebanon, anti-Lebanon mountains, and you come to the, the, um, uh, come to the Mediterranean. And that is, you know, that is the birthplace of civilizations, it's the birthplace of religions, the Holy Land is there, Levant, Mesopotamia, uh, and it's hugely wealthy. But that is the area that everybody has fought over for century of millennia, century after century. And these huge uh, migratory uh, movements of, of, of people, largely from the steppes of what would be you call Asia, uh, have come through. They're, they've either come through the Hungarian plains or they've come through um, uh, the, the area around the Caspian Sea over what is now Iran into Mesopotamia, the Levant Holy Land, and then where they can, trying to get up north through what is now Turkey or go further west into what is the civilization of, of Egypt. Very few people going south because of the deserts, but of course, you know, trade going through the Red Sea, Babel, Babel Mandeb, Strait of Hormuz, etc. So when you visualize that, you, you can see where the competition is going to take place. Um, and then, of course, you take the ethnic division. And, you know, it, it really is important that, uh, you know, one understands, you know, Turks are different from Iranians, are different from Arabs, uh, are different, to be honest with you, from, from Egyptians. Um, and then on all of those, you take a historical, back to a sense of historical entitlement. You know, you, you take the pre-Islamic civilization of Egypt and the, the, you know, the pharaonic civilization, which did dominate, of course, lots of Mesopotamia. Um, you take, of course, you know, the Iranians, pre-Islamic, the Achaemenids, you know, whose empire went all the way to Greece, dominated all of Anatolia, you know, not Constantinople as was, but that, that area. Um, and of course, Mesopotamia um, and the Sasanians. You know, you take the Arabs with the Umayyad and Abbasid dynasties. Again, Mesopotamia, the Levant, the Holy Lands, up into Anatolia. And then, of course, you take the Turks, you know, relative newcomers, who, again, had the Ottoman Empire. So all four building blocks in these sort of interesting geographical, you know, heartlands, I suppose, all have this great sense of historical entitlement. And, and that is still being played out. And then, of course, you add to that, you know, obviously the, the whole issue of Islam versus the, the rest. You know, it was up against Hinduism and Buddhism on its eastern flank. It was certainly up against Christianity, Orthodox Christianity. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the Balkans and, uh, and, and through Anatolia. Uh, it came up against Catholic uh, Christianity in the Mediterranean and, and Spain. Uh, and of course, then the issue of minorities, Armenians, Jews, Kurds. So you can take, uh, you, you, you then, so you've got, you've got that sort of Muslim identity. And then of course you take the, you know, the Sunni Shia split within Islam. You know, again, that, that has, was, the way Iran in sort of 1502 under Shah Ismail decided that a bit like Constantine had taken Christianity as the state religion of, of the Roman Empire, the Iranian Empire took Shiism as the state religion. And it defined them against the Arabs and the Turks. Um, and then, if I may, just another layer of you know, what I would call these building blocks, geographical, historical, ethnic, confessional, and then ideological. Of course, you, you get the, the, the Takfiri ideology going all the way back to the Battle of Sifin, you know, the Kharijites of 657. Um, and the ideology, the very fundamentalist ideology 
um, that you know crops up time and again in Islamic and therefore Middle Eastern history, um, uh, and which underpins you know Al Qaeda and Islamic State, but also to an extent the Wahhabis and the Ikhwan of Saudi Arabia. So again, without a sort of feel for the geography uh, and what is possible, you know, where, where armies can march, where migratory routes can go, where you can control trade, without an understanding of that, without an understanding of ethnic confrontation, conflict competition, without an understanding of the inspiration or the continuing importance of religion, etc. All of these make it very difficult for Westerners, liberal, secular, who increasingly wish to get rid of their own history, which means they're very, very poorly placed to understand other people's history. It makes it a very difficult, complex part of the world, not the only one, part of the world for, um, for people to come up with coherent policies. Well, that's, that's, uh, you put it in a very, very um, eloquent and as well very powerful way. So I want to touch uh, one, one question on that direction so that I have here. So um, I'm now coming to your book. So one of the, the things that your book uh, highlights that is particularly remarkable has been, he highlights the persistence that change of upville that there has been always long in the Middle East. But at the same time, it looks as a layer person, or, or at least with an intelligent, interested layer person, great understanding of this diverse and complex region. And as well, it offers a unique mixture of history, politics, academic study, and first-hand experience in, in your career that has been available to insight into fascinating and looking at the, the fractured and frustrating area of the world. So this book, uh, is as well a personal, uh, uh, very personal, very historical, and very researching. So how do you relate, uh, relate all of these areas together to create the book, and why did you put it this way? Because it, it, in one end, is a novel, or somehow an, an epic as well. Well, thanks, Dennis. Well, actually, the one thing I do want to say, I, I really love this region. Uh, I don't, I, and I don't mean that I have in a trite way. Um, I, I find it so sad. Um, the, the, there's so much goodwill, there's so much wonderful you know, history and culture and you know, one of the great religions of the world that it, is, that, that it has found itself this, on so many fault lines, as I say, be it, be it ethnic or be it religious or be it confessional, be it ideological. Um, and my time in, in, in working in that part of the world has been absolutely some of the most professionally and personally satisfying of my life. And I, I go back uh, routinely there and luckily a lot of what I continue to do uh, takes me back and great great friends Oman in particular I suppose you know people I've known for 40 years uh, youngsters I commanded who I still in contact with quite routinely uh, friends in Iraq friends in Lebanon uh, friends uh, in, in Egypt a lot of friends in Turkey so all of these you know there's a, there's a natural I don't, I don't think really it's quite difficult to deal with anything uh, well, if you don't like it, if you don't have, you know, it's like any subject, if you don't love it. And I don't claim, you know, I'm, 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 I'm so I, I think I put in my, you know, my um, uh, introduction, I am the product of obviously my own history, my own experience, my own whatever. And that makes me, you know, I'm, I'm an English, British, Christian, European, whatever. So I don't claim to be anything other than that in terms of, but it's a part, the Middle East is a part of the world I find fascinating and always has done. So I don't want to claim any arrogance or complacency about what I've written. What I wanted to do, Dennis, when I wrote the book, because I, I used to lecture on the Middle East a lot, largely, you know, history of, uh, and people would say, well, have you written anything? And I really wanted to make this fascinating part of the world, which was appeared on the screens, you know, people's you know, front pages or screens every day, normally to its disadvantage. It was normally, I'm afraid, a conflict, or it was refugees, or it was explosions, or it was, you know, it was terrorism. And yet, as people who know the region know, there are literally hundreds of millions of you know, great, great people and families trying to get on with life and improve themselves and educate themselves and make a thing. And they want to go home safely at night, um, you know, if possible. So I said, right, I, I would like to find something that and there's millions of books on the Middle East, but I wanted to write a book that was going to be accessible to what I call the intelligent, informed, uh, 
uh, interested lay person who might just say, right, I, you know, I'm really confused by this, but I'd love to be not spoon fed. You, you can simplify the Middle East. You cannot make it simple. Um, and for a while when I was doing drafts of the book, people said, well, there's two books here. Do, are you going to write a military memoir or are you going to write a book about the Middle East? And I said, no, trust me, I'm going to write this book. And I'm going to write a book about the Middle East, but I'm going to use my family story and my professional career as the scaffolding for the last hundred years, which is what it is, you know, largely. Um, and then I'm going to put a couple of chapters in that people could skip if they want to, but which I think are really important to understand the significance of Islam, the significance of the Prophet, the difference between the Quran and the Bible, um, the sense, as I say, of um, exceptionalism the Arabs have as the recipients of the word of God, um, the pillars of Islam, uh, the pride um, the Arabs had in being the, the people who exported in a remarkably short uh, amount of time the word of God, uh, and then the clashes they had. Um, and, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, Iranians and the diversity of the area that, that absorbed Islam. So I, I, I do genuinely think people need to understand the geography, the history, the confessional divide, ideology. Because if they've got that, then the story I tell, and I say, it's, you know, it's, only a, it's not that long a book, it's only 300 pages. But hopefully by a bit of repetition, where I found these reference points keep repeating themselves in terms of what inspires people, what makes them feel aggrieved, what motivates them, what makes them competitive or even violent, keep cropping up as they do, frankly, in all parts of the world. And then I thought, right, you know, when people have had enough of reading um, history or politics, we'll weave in a bit of a, a family story or a silly anecdote or a little bit of a feel for what, what life felt like or, a, as I say, a, 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 you know, just, just, just something that will keep people amused. And I think that um, most of the people who read it have been very supportive of that construction uh, as a way of keeping keeping the, um, the, the attention of the reader. So at the end, they do feel, I'm better informed, I feel quite well educated, um, but I enjoyed the journey. Uh, it, was, it was accessible, it was readable. Um, and so from that point of view, I think actually it, it will be helpful. And I, 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 you know, I'm grateful to you for helping me get, get it out to a slightly uh, wider audience, Dennis, because I, I, I think it has a role to play in expanding the, um, you know, ex expanding people's knowledge so they don't just go for God's sake, no, I'm going to turn off, I, I can't watch another, 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 this, that or the other. Um, uh, because as I say, I think, I think it's the most, one of the most fascinating regions of, of human development um, and it deserves better in many ways. And uh, it doesn't offer many answers, but it just says if you approach this region, do approach it with respect and a, an understanding and a um, and an admiration for, the, for the, the cultural historical achievements of this extraordinary part of the world. Oh, wonderful. So I want to, so I think we, we best one hour and something, but I still want to, two more questions or three, if you're okay with that. So one of the questions is, is like you said, the book is, is partly a personal memoir, but as well uh, an history of Middle East. So um, I think it's quite unique that you managed to, to put these two things together and they created actually a much more wealthy book and as well more interesting to read, but as well more educational, but as well more personal. So from this experience, and I think for people listening to us, especially young people um, that are listening to this, what would be the lessons that you would highlight? Because I think, of course, we're going to recommend and put highlights to the book and some excerpts from the book. But I would like to hear from this because I think one of the things that is very present uh, in your um, uh, narrative and in the book, but as well, especially in the way you speak and in your lectures, is a sense of civil servants, which I think is very important. The a sense of responsibility that I got as well from my parents, and as well, this is key. But, but as well, in your case, it's much more um, highlighted because of the sense of history, the sense of, of as well of all these different ecosystems where the book takes present. So I would like to, this personal part, the sense of 
career and the sense as well of uh, uh, narrative around the region that is so powerful and so intense? Well, you, you really always took the words out of my mouth, um, Dennis, because the one thing I was going to say about it was an encouragement for people, A, to, yes, to really, the younger element, you know, other people set on their careers, but to do think seriously about, about public service. Um, I, as I said, loved history and therefore I wished to be in a service that took part in events that would in, in turn become historical. And I would sort of say history is politics today, but today's politics will be history in due course. And if you like history and you feel you've got something to contribute to it, um, then public service is an important thing. And uh, our politicians do get a hell of a beating nowadays. Um, and sometimes they deserve it um, because they don't prepare themselves properly for public service. But equally, they have a hugely important role because they will make the decisions. The best thing, of course, is informed decisions. Um, our, our diplomats, hugely important, all of us, for all our, all our countries, for making sure that, um, uh, you know, issues can be dealt with, hopefully without resorting to, 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 to organised violence. Uh, and then the military, the military just suited me um, hugely for, as I say, the intellectual aspect of it, uh, the institutional aspect of it, the mixture of uh, academia, I suppose, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and the sort of physical challenges. Um, I loved the variety. Um, I loved the travel. I loved the engagement in other parts of the world. I, I think aligned with that, though, if you go to areas of public service that are to do with service abroad or policy issues that impact either on your own country or others, you, you owe it to people to be well prepared. Uh, hence, I do think this attempt to, as I say, denigrate the study of history, proper study of history, warts and all, criticise it, look at it objectively, accept some people are going to be subjective, factor that in, see where go, look at it from outside. Really important if you're going to go out uh, and be and carry the responsibility on the one hand, as I said, that double responsibility as a soldier. Uh, on the one hand, the responsibility for trying to pursue the policies set for you by your government, not always nationally, quite often uh, supranationally on behalf of the UN or NATO or EU. So you've got that responsibility to try and bring that. The other responsibility, of course, is to take your soldiers to war or all on operations uh, with the best, the best chance of success and survival. So it's a very interesting double you know, multi-dimensional responsibility that I think senior officers have. And they have also responsibility then to impart that to, as I say, their civil, their civil service counterparts. And their civil service counterparts should at least have the good grace to listen respectfully when soldiers who are going to put their lives on the line uh, in the pursuit of a policy uh, come with words of either advice or warning or uh, or, or, or mitigation. Um, and hence, I think, as I say, that, you know, it probably goes back to a, our earlier discussion, Dennis. For me, I think the study of history is both a wonderfully innovating, you know, inspirational study. I think it's a fantastic thing. But I do think it's, it's, it's capacity to inform politics, policy making, has never been more relevant. As I say, when we've, we've slightly got away from the universalism of communism, uh, we've seen battering the, universal, the universalism of liberal democracy. And therefore, an old-fashioned uh, old capacity to analyze and weigh up the motivations of people, some of which, as I say, will be historical, uh, geographical, ethnic. I, th I think it's an, important, it's an imp increasingly important, important discipline. Always has been, and still is. And, uh, should not be should not should not be lightly dismissed. No, I, I think it's uh, it's very powerful uh, words, and I think it's really very important, special for young generations. Um, so I have my last two questions, <laughs> and I'll let you relax a bit, and probably we might do another one because I, I have a lot of other questions, but I think it's quite a big one. So in, recently, you were highlighted in a podcast about the future of defense. Um, so, um, of course, in this series, we've been interviewing very high-profile technologists, and I've been working a lot in technology. And, of course, um, 
if you look at history, and I'm particularly interested to look at this from the angle of history, so the military has been always the first normally um, area where the technology has been going far further, and as well having more implementation, both from ideas, from uh, technology, and a lot of different things. With so many things going on in technology, especially with the inception of artificial intelligence, a lot of other big advanced technologies, um, and of course, I think artificial intelligence, we're going to have, uh, for instance, uh, last week, officially, the French army uh, put a, a regula regulatory ethical uh, presentation about bionic uh, soldiers. And this is official. I'm not talking about anything that is not public. And um, I'm particularly interested in giving your wealth of experience dealing with, first of all, very big uh, positions in the military and in defense, but as well dealing with very big uh, confrontal regions like the Iraq that you mentioned, where we were part of the, prime, the former prime minister of the UK responsible for managing part of the conflict. And how do you see this convergence between, you mentioned very importantly, and I love the way you put it, the geography, the history, the ideologies, and all these different things that make us humans but at the same time, now technology is accelerating all of this and a level of change that is never seen probably in history of, of mankind, at least in, in the velocity. Uh, military was always advanced and, and most of the, the biggest changes in technology came actually out of the defense and the people in the defense. So I would like to see how do you see this future of defense with the, and as well with your head of history uh, expert, which I think is particularly important not to lose that. You, you, you clearly kept the simplest question to last. <laughs> um, it is a huge, uh, it, it's a huge challenge. Um, it does, it throws up an extraordinary number of challenges. You know, one of which, of course, is ethical and mo moral. Um, although that, you know, that, that has been the whole issue. Just war gets, takes us all the way back, you know, you know, millennia. The whole issue of crossbows or dumb dumb bullets or Greek fire. Um, you know, a lot of these things have always been, you know, raised really major social, social and uh, ethical issues within their time. And I think now the capacity to, you know, war is no longer simply a sort of, you know, a merging of, you know, humans and technology, industri industrial scale, then technological, now digital. Um, robotics, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, um, you know, a raft of things are, 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 are really beginning to blur the lines. Uh, and at the heart of it, you again, you go back to, you have policies and then you have people. Uh, and there are increasing levels of, as you say, technology and digitization in between, in between those. And um, in some areas, of course, technology will help us do our business much better, uh, much better, he said, if you'll forgive the expression, soldier. Uh, but there are ways, you know, in a very benign way that um, technology will help uh, soldiers contribute, and I use soldiers in the poorest sense, soldiers contribute to a, in a, all sorts of things that soldiers are quite useful for, humanitarian operations and disaster relief and peacekeeping and refugee stuff. Um, at a you know, at the macro level, when you're talking about state-on-state -state conflict, God forbid, um, of course, the, 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 the sort of spiral of development, counter-development gets faster and faster. And there is a sort of new arms race, and it's not the traditional one of numbers of tanks and, you know, numbers of ballistic missiles, although they have a role to play still. Um, but it is, can you outmaneuver somebody either through um, you know, cyber attack or, I dare say, domination of the, um, uh, you know, the social media sphere. You know, can you, can you bring down critical national infrastructure? Um, and the blurring of, of what's war, what is peace, what is confrontation, uh, what is conflict is, is, is really very difficult for politicians and policymakers and military people to, to manage. Uh, you know, we would all have hoped at one stage that we were going in the sort of what I paraphrase as the Francis Fukuyama version, vision that we were going for free trade and globalization and liberal democracy and free speech, etc. But we, we actively know that in certain parts of the world that isn't happening. And people are going to pursue their 
national agendas or political agendas, uh, occasionally through the use of of um, uh, of, of, of conflict and confrontation. Uh, and in some areas, it is not the kinetic world that it was was before. And so we are duty bound to stay. I suppose we have the capacity, at least, to, to stay on the frontiers of technology. A lot of that technology obviously bleeds over into civilian life, uh, and again has huge benefits on a much wider, uh, a much wider scale. But at the heart of soldiering, undoubtedly, you know, be it um, Iraq or Afghanistan or dare I say up on the Kashmir, whatever, between the Chinese and the, uh, and, and the Indians recently, is normally a, a human being. Uh, and although technology has advanced us in a most extraordinary manner, the motivations of human beings in some ways have not really moved hugely forward, although the context in which we think has. And so the pressures in time and space, the compression of time, time and space for decision-making or for action, uh, do, put huge, do put huge pressure on, 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 on commanders. I was interested, and just, just to finish, there was a, there's a quote in my book, uh, Dennis, from, from Robert Gates, uh, when he was leaving the Secretary of State for Defense uh, under Obama. And just to paraphrase, he, he, just, he does, however, say, just be very careful about those who come to you, systems analysts or computer war gamers, and tell you such and such a technology is the silver bullet to all our issues to do with military problem, problem solving. Uh, and just never forget that quite often you will still, as we always have done, have to close with the enemy, hill by hill, block by bloody block. And so the requirement to get still excellent young men and women, again, to sign up for public service, intelligent people who will come into the military with an understanding of politics history, with an empathy with other people, uh, in order to absorb this technology, use it hopefully for good, um, remains really, really important. This will not ever be a, uh, a, 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 a field of human endeavor or activity in which we believe that we can totally delegate, I don't believe, to machines. Hard-pressed men and women will be involved in both the decision-making and the execution. They may be assisted, they equally may be thwarted by, uh, by, by, by technology and, dig uh, and, and digitalization. Well, you put it brilliantly. I, I think it's a great way to, to wrap up and I think that, that sums as well a lot of things. So as last, uh, uh, the last part, I would like just, uh, if you want just to highlight about your book, I think some, some things for our audience, A Soldier in the Sand, A Personal History of the Modern Middle East, um, that is in hardcover and is available in Amazon. So I don't know if you want just to highlight some, some areas or some, a quote or something like that for people listening to us. Um, well, it's really kind, Dennis, and I, I, you know, in among everything, I hope um, that um, you know, our conversation will give people a sort of idea of what is covered in, in the book. It, it, it really is, it was, it was designed to be a tribute to the people I've worked with, particularly the soldiers I had the privilege of command. It was a tribute, to, say, to my own parents and grandparents for their, uh, their influence on my life, uh, and the combination did allow me the chance, I think, to erect a quite useful scaffold uh, ar around which one could explain to people who don't really have the time. I'm not saying there aren't terrific experts out there. Some of your listeners and viewers may, may be among them who know this region far better than I do. But it was tr to try and use the sort of the human dimension and the participant action in order to give a part of the world that... Uh, Need, needs greater understanding, more, more visibility. And so, as I say, I really, it's not a book for the expert, although I think even an expert, I hope, would enjoy it because it's full of anecdotes, but it is very much aimed at the intelligent, interested, informed uh, individual who feels that they would either like to know more or should know more uh, about this, this region. And I hope at the end of it, will feel much more confident that they can understand what they're looking at. Because as I say, if they get history, geography, ethnicity, religion, they will begin to see the connectivities that lead to the flashpoints that produce the slightly unsettling or rather unsettling headlines in the papers or on the televisions that confront us on an all too routine basis.
Thank you so much and uh, brilliant words to, to wrap up. So I, I thank you for your time and uh, for inspiration as well. A lot of uh, complex subjects that you put it brilliantly, but as well, especially this, this wealth of history experience and as well uh, looking at the present, the past, and especially in the future as well. Thank you so much, Sir Simon Mayall. Thank you very much, Liz, and to all your watchers and listeners. Goodbye.